the Bible's not in the least bit shy about revealing the the failures and the weaknesses and the character flaws of the people it describes. It's an honest book as well as a truthful book. As we come now to Genesis chapter 37, we see uh, a number of uh, examples of wickedness, but there's something I want us to to see in the background of that wickedness, and that is God's plan for dealing with wickedness. You remember in the story of Ruth that when uh, Naomi and Elimelech uh, leave the promised land in a context of a famine and head to Moab. They're living there. Their sons take local girls for spouses and eventually Elimelech and the sons are all dead. And now you've got three women in Moab without husbands. And Naomi uh, reasons thus saying, I'm, I'm going to go back home. And, uh, her mindset is, I'm, I'm too old to remarry, but in the land that I come from, God has established law uh, such that people in my circumstance don't get taken advantage of. It's someplace safe for me to be. You ladies stay here, get you husbands, and the husbands will keep you safe. And of course, we know the rest of the story. Orpah ends up staying. Ruth says, no, I'm going to go with you. Your people are going to be my people. Well, God did establish various and sundry laws uh, that he designed for the purpose of uh, dealing with, if not hardship, at least the of sin, rather, at least the consequences of sin, such as the hardship of a spouse dying. So when we come to Genesis chapter 37, we have the account of Judah, one of the twelve, uh, marrying and having children, and his son Ur uh, is given a wife in Tamar, and he dies, and Tamar is now put under the protection and the care of Onan, at least until such time as God should bless Tamar with a son, and that son will be in a position uh, to care for his mother. That's the situation. This uh, Leverite uh, law is t- developed more fully in uh, the Pentateuch as God's giving the law to his people before they go into the promised land. But the principles are already in place here. And so Onan is told, you need to go in and you need to be with Tamar uh, so that she can have a son. And then that son will be the son of Ur. Well, Onan, and not just Onan, as we'll see later on in the chapter, Onan sort of uh, illustrates the R.C. Sproul Jr. principle of hermeneutics even inside the Bible. That principle, you'll remember, says that whenever we see someone in the Bible doing something really, really stupid, we should not say to ourselves, why are they so stupid? We should instead say to ourselves, why am I stupid just like them? Or how am I stupid just like them? I'm reminded of the Pharisees who took something beautiful, something that revealed the character of God, his law, and they twisted it and they distorted it and they used it to their advantage, which is precisely what Onan does here. It would be one thing for Onan to say, you know, I really don't want to raise up uh, a son for my brother. Uh, this is not something I'm interested in doing. I know it's a scary thing. I know it's a cowardly thing, but uh, no, I'm just not, I'm not going to participate in that. It'd be another thing for Onan to say, okay, I'll do it and to do it. But here's what he does. He decides that he's going to take for himself uh, sexual favors from Tamar without granting her the blessing of the child. The text tells us that Onan would go into Tamar and he would spill his seed upon the ground. Now, there are those who will use this text as an argument against uh, either uh, artificial forms of birth control and or masturbation. 
for what it's worth, I'm against both of those things. <laughs> but I'm not sure this text uh, is the ground of either of those arguments. I think instead what we're seeing here is, as I said, uh, Onan wanting to take advantage of God's law that gives him access to Tamar without taking responsibility for the very reason why he's been given access to Tamar, for want of a better word. And so God kills Onan. And Judah says, well, I've got another son. I don't want to keep losing sons uh, who end up sleeping with this woman. So uh, let, let's, uh, I'll tell you what, let's wait till my son's old enough and then we'll, uh, then he can uh, give you a son. But then he doesn't. He doesn't protect Tamar and it gets worse. Tamar, knowing that she is not being protected, she is not being cared for, that Judah and his sons, this family, this, this patriarch in this family, is not honoring God and is not keeping his law. And they are exposing her vulnerability. The law that God has given for her protection, they're using for their advantage. And so Tamar does something difficult, but profoundly clever. She hears that Ju Judah is uh, out on the road, going to be doing some uh, work far away. She covers her face. She goes and uh, hangs out by the gate of the city along the way, uh, taking the, uh, adopting the pose and the manners of a prostitute. And Judah, who seems to be the father of Onan, this person who doesn't look at uh, what God has to say with respect to uh, what we're called to sexually in terms of loyalty and faithfulness, Judah decides, hey, I'm, I'm well off, I'm prosperous, I'm away on a business trip. I think I'll avail myself of this prostitute. She knows who he is. He's not in disguise. And so she determines to uh, seize the opportunity to expose him for what he is. So he says, you know, let me come in to you. I will send you a goat. She says, how do I know you're going to send me a goat? I need a pledge from you. Let me have your signet and uh, these, these symbols of who you are. He says, all right. He sleeps with her. And now she's pregnant. Now, mercy. Think about this. Uh, it's not that Judah is his own grandpa, uh, but Judah is the father and the grandfather of this child that he uh, that Tamar is now carrying. Now, one of the things that's common, it's not always there, but one of the things that's common uh, with those who are uh, willing and able to take the law of God and use it and twist it and distort it for their own advantage is that they're also ironically quick to use it to condemn others. Such that now word comes to Judah that his daughter-in-law, the widow, the one who's supposed to be in mourning, is pregnant. And what's his immediate response? Does he think to himself, Man, we are a broken family. We are a dysfunctional family. Uh, you get, you come into this family and things just go wrong. We've got uh, Ur dying. We've got Onan cheating uh, his responsibility towards Tamar, and he's dead. Look at me. I'm a person who goes to prostitutes, and now we got Tamar uh, catting around and getting pregnant. No. It's not his posture. His posture, this same man who was perfectly willing to go into a prostitute is now determining that Tamar should be put to death. Of course, we all see what's coming. We all have that, that element of dramatic irony where we know part of the story that the character in the story doesn't know. Uh, 
Judah doesn't know what uh, Tamar is carrying around in her purse. Uh, but she now comes and says, oh, by the way, the fellow who uh, impregnated me, uh, he, he's the one who owns these things. And of course, they belong to Judah. And Judah, to his credit, I'm not saying he's a good man. I'm not undoing the things that he's done, but to his credit, at this point, once he's exposed, he's forced to acknowledge that Tamar was more righteous than he is. Think about what that acknowledgement means. You know, friends, the Bible is abundantly clear. It's, a, it's clear in the book of Genesis. It's clear in the book of Ephesians. It's clear everywhere in between. The Bible is abundantly clear that God has established husbands as the heads of their home. Men and women are equal in value and dignity and standing as joint heirs with Christ. They have equal in ability. But husbands are called to lead their families, to be the heads of their homes. So every time I teach on this, I, I, I try to help husbands understand the reason you have been given authority is not for the sake of your comfort, but for the sake of their protection. You've not been given authority for the sake of your comfort, but for the sake of their protection. God has blessed me with a wonderful wife. She's an amazing woman. I'm so grateful for her. She blesses me in ways that I just would take too long for me to begin to catalog the ways that God blesses her through me. But God didn't give her to me to make my life more comfortable. He didn't give her to me for me to be able to have a sandwich when I want a sandwich. He gave her to me to protect, to wash, to sanctify. To wash her, this is what I mean by sanctify, to wash her with the water of the word, the way the, whole, the way that Jesus washes the church with the water of the word. I'm not saying I'm the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying that I have that power. What I am saying is that I'm a tool in God's hands for her washing. Do you see the difference? If I say to my wife, here, oh wife, I sort of take a Lamech pose. Oh, Lisa, hear the song of R.C. I want ice cream. I demand ice cream every night. I want it on a cone. I want these flavors. I want it formed this way and shaped this way. And thou, O oh wife, whom God has given to me as my help, suitable to me. This is how you shall help me. Give me the ice cream. I'm missing the point. Do you know why I have authority? I have authority for the purpose of blessing and protecting her. The same is th uh, true with respect to our children. Remembering that Tamar is a daughter-in-law a widowed daughter-in-law of Judah that he is called to protect. Friends, I want you to remember that in the context of the temptations that we face towards sexual sin. One of the lessons we can draw from this, whether it's... Uh, adultery with our bodies or adultery in our minds. If we are uh, consuming pornography or if we are uh, paying for sexual encounters in one way or another, we have to remember that 
every one of these women is somebody's daughter. And so it shouldn't surprise us that we see Judah, who is indifferent to the shame that he's bringing on to this unknown person to him, ends up bringing shame on his own daughter-in-law. You can't hermetically seal your sins from the people that you love and care about and are called to look after and protect. That's not how it works. Again, it's just so easy for us to look at cultural norms or biblical law, either one, as designed to give us advantage, to meet what, uh, to, to meet our desires. And it's just not so. Tamar humbly placed herself under the authority of her husband, Ur. And in God's providence, Ur was called home. And to a degree, and for a time, she was placed under the care of Onan, who abused her for his own sexual gratification. And God killed Onan. Then Judah, wanting to protect his next oldest son, puts off and delays and doesn't bring to pass the obligation that he has. And Judah, unknowingly, but nevertheless knowing it was with someone, used a woman, turns out it's his daughter-in-law, used a woman for his own sexual gratification. This is not a good sign for the future of God's people. And you know, we see that future coming to pass even in the life of David. We see it continue after David in Solomon. We see it going further into the future and into our own day as well whether it is as a husband, whether it is as a father, whether, whether it is as a, a, a boss, whether it is as a pastor, whether it is as a counselor. When God grants you authority, leadership, your own sin, and the serpent himself will be right beside you saying, Here's how you can use this to your advantage. Be like Judah. Be like Onan. Well, we are to be like Judah in this sense. When we fall, when we fail, when we are confronted with the reality of our sins, the only thing we can do is acknowledge them. Our authority does not only not mean that we don't have, that, that, that others under our authority exist for our well-being, it surely doesn't mean that we're more spiritually mature than they. I get to record these for my friend at Exposit the Word, my friend David Knight. I get to teach Bible studies. I get to write books. But you know, I've got a spiritual better in my wife. Yes, I'm called to lead, but she is a woman who knows God so deeply, so intimately. <laughs> By God's grace, I know that if I should ever be tempted to use her, I'll end up where Onan ended up, dead, because she is the apple of his eye. Friends, honor your wives and protect those who've been put under your care. Do not take advantage of the authority that you've been given, but serve those you lead. Lay down your life for the sheep that he's put under your care.